Well, welcome to this video. Uh, we're having a look in this video at 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9 to 11. This doesn't fall within a series through the book of 1 Corinthians. We are just focusing in on this short passage in response in many ways to the uh, sexual confusion in our world and just confusion from Christians about how to respond to those um, who, who we see as uh, sinners in the world around us and particularly thinking of those in the realm of, of sexual sin and I hope that this video will be helpful just to get your mind around how we should respond as Christians to these things. The sermon I preached from this short section I called What, what Some of You Were. As I always do in these videos I encourage you to go and read through this passage a number of times yourself just to familiarize yourself with what is there, take some time to pray and ask God to help you to understand his truth. And this section in 1 Corinthians, we do need to read within the context of uh, this letter to the Corinthians. Paul had spent about 18 months with this church. While he was there, he had taught them. We're told in Acts 18 that uh, many in the city of Corinth turned and became believers in our Lord Jesus. But after being away from them for a time, Paul has written this letter largely in response to a report that came his way, uh, helping to show some of the real flaws in their thinking and their practice as Christians. This phrase, do you not know, uh, Paul uses those words in this letter 12 times and He's pretty much saying to them, guys, this should have been, been obvious to you. How have you not seen this? How did you miss this in the 18 months that I was with you? And one clear area in which they needed correction was in the area of sexual sin. And Paul does address that in this passage, but he expands it. Not only sexual sin here, but sin in general. What we see in this letter to the Corinthians is that uh, this Corinthian church were an incredibly spiritually gifted church, but they were also very immature. And so much of this letter, Paul is saying to them, uh, guys, you need to grow up. You need to grow in Christ likeness. Your salvation through Jesus needs to be seen in a growing godliness in your lives. And in this particular passage, he throws the net quite wide to highlight a number of particular areas of sinfulness. Um, and he gives them a great warning, but then he also gives us a wonderful view of what has happened to those who have been saved by Jesus. Structurally, uh, verse 9 and 10 go together, and then verse 11 is in many ways the answer to the problem that is raised in verse 9 and 10. Uh, we see uh, twice in verse 9 and 10, will not inherit the kingdom of God, um, and none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. And so that repeated idea, Paul is saying, well, you can't just carry on living as Corinthians. You now need to live as Christians. Because although they were Corinthian Christians, uh, these, they were looking far more Corinthian than they were looking Christian. And so Paul says, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, that word for wrongdoers there is uh, the unrighteous or lawbreakers. Uh, what we'll see in the passage is that uh, Paul contrasts this with those who were justified. Uh, they are the same root word, that's just the negative of uh, this word. So they are unrighteous and here they are those who have been made righteous. And so Paul is saying those who are wrongdoers, unrighteous, lawbreakers, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Uh, Paul uses this same phrase in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33. Do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. And so he's saying, don't deceive yourself. Don't think that you can carry on living as a wrongdoer, living with 
bad company, the, those who are still living very much as sinful Corinthians rather than as Christian Corinthians. And then Paul lists uh, a whole list here of different kinds of sin. Very often when uh, we look at this list, the ones that jump out at us are the sexually immoral and the adulterers and men who practice homosexuality. Those are the ones where a lot of the current discussion and debate is happening, particularly thinking about what is happening in the LGBTQIA plus movement. So people who are in this world pushing the agenda um, of this community will come to a passage like this in the Bible and use it as fuel to write God's word off. But it is very useful to see that Paul doesn't only speak of sexual sins. He also speaks of idolaters, uh, that is those who worship anything other than the Lord God. And some of the great idolatry of our day is the worship of self. Uh, then he, he mentions things that are uh, far more normal in many ways, the, the respectable sins. There are sins of greed and secret drunkenness or slander, uh, swindlers and thieves uh, you could uh, lump together. In some ways, they're a similar thing, cheating people out of uh, their, their possessions in different ways. So it is just important to see that it's not just sexual sins that Paul is talking about. It's uh, misplaced worship. It's those who steal in different ways. It's the greedy, the drunkards, the slanderers. So it's throwing the net really wide to the types of sins, just looking at a couple of these words. So uh, this word, the, the Greek word is um, pornos, uh, from which we get our word pornography. Uh, so it is uh, sexually deviant, uh, moving away from um, God's good design for sex. And we can see in our world that pornos is a massive issue. Pornography is destroying many. Uh, when it comes to thieves here, uh, the Greek word is uh, kleptos, kleptes. So from which we get our word uh, kleptomaniac. So stealing stealthily, um, and as I said, swindling is somewhat linked because that's carrying off other people's goods in an unjust way. Um, this idolaters, as I said, the, the worship of self is uh, something that we see a lot in our world. And so narcissism might come to mind where we think of uh, the current day idolatry. Uh, the greedy here is somebody who's always wanting more. The drunkards here is the idea of having a lifestyle of drinking, where for us in Cape Town, there is a terribly destructive drinking culture in the world around us. Um, slanderers, those who uh, they are characterized by character assassination. They love insulting others. And as we look at all of these things, it's easy for us to point to the world outside and say, oh yeah, that's what they are. But that's not what Paul is doing here. He's saying, do you not know? Do not be deceived. And he's saying, actually, these things have no place within the church. So he's actually pointing to the Christians in this church. And he's saying, you need to cut these things out of your own lives. You can't be characterized by pornos or idolatry, or adultery, or homosexuality, or kleptomania, or, or greed, or drunkenness, or slandering, or swindling. Because people who continue in these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it is a massive warning here. And as we think about this, reflect on it, and meditate on these truths, we need to pray that the Lord would open our eyes to see where these things are, are still at play within us where we are allying ourselves with some area of sin that we actually need to increasingly cut ties from and completely cut ties from because we are now Christians. Uh, here Paul does refer to men who practice homosexuality, but if you go and have a look at uh, Romans 1 verse 26 to 27, uh, you'll see that it's, Paul also refers to women who uh, 
who are homosexual women. And you can go and look in uh, Leviticus 18, uh, verse 22, or uh, Leviticus 20, verse 13. Just a couple of places in the Old Testament that <clears throat> speak about uh, how deadly uh, homosexuality is. But we see, if you go and read in uh, Genesis 19, this was a problem from the early, early days of our uh, of society. As Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of their sexual immorality and their homosexuality. And then uh, Numbers 25, uh, following on the story of Balaam, we, we see that he taught the Moabite woman how to entice the Israelites by uh, being sexually immoral with them. Uh, so we see that these things aren't uh, new to our world in any way. And if we think uh, that our society is uh, far more sexually advanced or progressive than the society in Corinth, then you need to remember, go read a bit about Corinth. To Corinthianize someone in their day was to sleep with them, to have sex with them. Uh, or to call somebody a Corinthian girl was to call her a prostitute. So they were an incredibly sexualized society. And what Paul is saying here is these things have no place within God's household. Do you not know? If you continue in these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're in danger of hell. So it is a very, very big warning that Paul gives in this section. And then he says the glorious words in verse 11. And that is what some of you were. That is what some of you were. That is a, a phrase worth reflecting on um, and rejoicing in. Because none of us as Christians can claim any moral higher ground because all of us were sinners. We weren't members of God's kingdom. Uh, we were enemies of God, lawbreakers, wrongdoers, unrighteous. That is what some of you were. And then he goes through this glorious list. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Paul uses the same word of himself when he's telling of his conversion story in Acts 22, verse 16. And he's saying, just as he was washed, so they were washed. Their, their sins were washed away. And this idea of being sanctified is a part of our salvation. It's that a gradual growing righteousness. But in this context, sanctified is being used that we, we no longer have this desire to sin. Yes, we will still struggle with sin, but the desire to keep on sinning uh, has been broken. So you have been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. As I said, that's the opposite. We're no longer counted as unrighteous, wrongdoers, lawbreakers. We're counted as righteous. Why? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. Because that is what you were, and we couldn't do anything about that. So that's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that his blood could wash us clean. That by his spirit, this work of sanctification could begin in our hearts and continue in our hearts. That we might be justified. All of this is only possible because of who Jesus is. And what he's done for us. And so this passage should give us fuel as we think about the, the sin in society around us. It should seriously grieve us. But it shouldn't surprise us. Because that is what some of you were. But for our Lord Jesus Christ, we would still be counted among uh, those sinners in the society around us. So instead of uh, seeing these... Uh, distorted desires playing out in the society around us, instead of that fueling our fury, it should cause us to cry out to God that those who we get to interact with, that we might have an opportunity to speak of what Jesus has done for us, that he's washed us, sanctified us, justified us. And our prayer should be that others in the world around us might be able to say, 
That is what I was. But because of Jesus, I was washed. I was sanctified. I was justified. So I pray that this would fuel you to be praying more earnestly for those in the society around you who are living in rebellion against God. At this stage, they aren't a part of God's kingdom. And our prayer should be that they join God's kingdom. So we don't want to respond in such a way that destroys our platform to share the gospel with them. Rather, we want to respond in a way that will point people to Jesus as their only hope so that they might join his kingdom and one day be with him for all eternity. And so I encourage all of you to just take some time and meditate on this truth. That is what some of you were. Take some time to thank the Lord God for saving you, for washing you, sanctifying you, justifying you. Don't use that as an opportunity to stand on some higher moral ground because that is what some of you were. Actually, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he tells us that all of us were dead in our transgressions and sins. But God made us alive in Christ. It is by grace you've been saved. And so we don't want to stand on a higher moral ground. On Christ, the solid rock, we want to stand. And we want to point those around us to him and pray that those who are continuing in their wrong, lawbreakers, the unrighteous, that they would turn to Jesus and be washed and sanctified and justified. So as we rejoice in this truth, may we hold it out to a world who desperately need it. Well, God bless as you dig in further.